Today, I want to continue on the debt reduction series that we've been doing. This is part 11, our 11th session in a biblical approach to debt and how to, to come out of it, and how to eliminate and eradicate debt. I want to encourage you not to lose heart because this is a process, right? While it's a process, I also believe that God will grace us with overt, supernatural, miraculous demonstrations of help and favor in this process. But I want to encourage you to be diligent at it and to seek to come out of it holistically. Amen. So this is the 11th session. I cannot recap all that we've done up until this point, both Andy and I. Andy shared powerfully last week. If you've missed last week's session, it's, on, it's available on the YouTube uh, channel, and also it will be uploaded as an audio onto my website soon. Today I want to speak on one particular cause of debt and, how, and a biblical approach to it and how to come out of it. It's a bit long, but I, I, want, I want to deal with this holistically in this session and, and complete it. And it's, it's got to do with laziness. It's got to do with lethargy. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to talk to you about laziness, a biblical perspective of laziness. Please don't leave the meeting now. <laughs> okay? Because most of us think we're not lazy until the scriptures confront your definition of laziness. And what does it mean? Now, just to quickly get through to the, to, with the basics, the term that is often synonymously used with lazy or laziness in the Old Testament is sluggard. You sluggard. And most often, the book of Proverbs and or Psalms will address the lazy person as, oh, you sluggard. The New Testament equivalent will be the word slothful that Paul and other New Testament writers would often employ. So you'll hear me use those terms interchangeably. The lazy person, laziness, the sluggard, or the slothful or the sluggish person. Okay. Now, the Hebrew word for sluggard suggests the following. It, it is useless. It has the connotations of one that is useless. If you're lazy, biblically from a Hebrew perspective, you would be relegated to a place of uselessness. So there's, it's unproductive. There's a, no productivity attendant with your life. Okay? It, it also has the idea of sluggishness. right? Sluggishness, kind of. When you think of a sluggish person, there's an element of drag or slowness, lack of urgency, lack of zeal, lack of intensity. So there's an indolence. So to be indolent is of a synonym for lazy. So indolence is equated to, to laziness as well. But the word also indicates negligence. Right? So if you neglect something that you ought to do and not to do it, publicly would be equated to you being lazy. Okay? Now, for example, Proverbs 10 verse 4 says the following, poor is, the pers poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent will make rich. So here in this verse, two positions are contrasted. The contrast is between the negligent and the diligent, right? The one would tend to poverty and the other would tend to rich, to richness or wealth. Okay, now I really want to encourage you, far from what is most commonly believed, most, well peop most wealthy people haven't inherited the wealth. Most wealthy people, this is um, clinically proven studies, most wealthy people have attained their wealth by hard work, by diligence, by putting the time in, by putting the effort in. You only get out what you, you put in. What I want to prov hope to provoke in this session today is a renewed sense of diligence, of hard work, of industry, of commitment, of fervor, of zeal, and of passion towards the work of your hands. Because I'm going to pray a prayer at the end of this at the command of the Lord that God must bless the work of our hands. God told me literally to do this. And that the context of your work environment, whatever it may be, is now going to go to a new level of fruitfulness, a new level of favor, a new level 
of, of income generation, generating capacity because of a blessing and a favor from God. How many of you know what you do need in this life is the grace of God? What you do need in this life is an advantage over most. It will be the favor of God upon you. You and your colleague can be equally qualified, equally experienced, equally adept at what you do. Yet the difference and the distinction on you, the edge that you have over them, could be something on your life called the presence of God, the favor of God. There's something about you that gives you the edge over others. And it's that dynamic that we want. But I want to encourage you, God is not obligated to support a lazy person. God has got no, if you study the scriptures, there's no inclination in God's heart to attend to a lazy man. There's something about laziness that God finds so distasteful, right? Because he, as a God, is a worker. If you look at the creation account, he, he took meticulous detail at setting the six-day creation account before he enters the seventh day called the rest, where the Bible says, and he ceased from his labors. Now, God is still working, but not in the way that you and I know it to be. If it says, and the Lord God, um, after he made the heavens and the earth, ceased from his works, created the heavens, the earth, and the Bible says, and the hosts that are in them, he entered a day called rest, a position out of which he has not come out yet. God is in perpetual rest, but yet he works, because how he worked has established principles that ensure he will always work from a position of rest, right? So tell your neighbor, you've got to work in rest. The world says don't work hard, work smart. In the kingdom, we say work hard, but work in rest. Yeah? Paul uh, was convinced that he worked, but he worked by the principle of the grace of God attending everything that he put effort to. Let's just look at it quickly. 1 Corinthians, what is it, 15, verse 9. I am the least of the apostles. I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the, the church of God. Verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored. The word labor yet means I, I worked. Paul was a worker. No person that God significantly used in the Bible was idle. There's not one individual, Old or New Testament, that was majorly used by God that was just idle, lazy, nothing to do kind of person, laying around that God says, oh, I see you're idle. Yeah, come, let me, let me use you. Here's a major task for you. Deliver my people from Israel, from Egypt. Right? Uh, everybody was doing something, but listen carefully. Everybody that was doing something was doing it with all of their hearts total focus with total zeal and all God did he took the same emphasis and he redirected it to a different focus right so Paul says this I labored up more than them all them all here are the other apostles Paul makes a huge boast put them all together I worked harder than anybody I labored more than them all but he quickly qualifies it by saying yet not I but the the grace of God that is with me. So one of the principles of hard work that you must learn, you must learn to work hard, not in perspiration, but in grace. It's not by the sweat of your brows, not by your human effort. Your effort and your capacity will take you so far. There's something about grace that takes you way beyond what human limitations define. The grace of God will give you the edge beyond what is humanly possible. I don't have time to talk about grace here now. But that's the nature of grace. If human capacity says so far and no further, grace says I will take you further. Because it will not be based on your skill sets, your capacity. It will all be a result of the grace of God attending what you do. So to work in a position of rest is to work hard. A lot of people have the view that grace makes you lazy. No, it doesn't. He said, I am what I am by the Grace, but I labor. Grace doesn't make you lazy. Grace makes you work more harder than you've ever done. Yet, at the end of your hard work, you're not finished. You're still um, poised. You're still 
sober, you're still together, simply because you've employed the principle of work by the power of grace. Okay? And that is how you work in rest. A lot of people often comment and say concerning us, you do so much, there's so much going on in your family life, your personal life, your, your ministry life, etc., your extra ministry life in terms of the broader focus of ministry that we're involved in. How is it all possible? There's only one conclusion I have come to. It's nothing but the grace of God in action. Because left to ourselves, we would have been finished. Okay. Now the Greek word, so for slothful, I told you slothful is a synonym for lazy in the New Testament Greek. The New Testament uh, Greek is okneros, but okneros even sounds bad actually. Okneros is from a derivative or from the root okneo, which literally means to be slow uh, or to delay. Now, if you get the thing done, but not on time, you are lazy, publicly. It means to have a sense of drag and sluggishness attendant with you. If you are a person that always defers and postpones, you are lazy. Everyone said, ouch. <laughs> if you keep deferring, you keep putting it off, publicly you are slothful. Right? Now, we don't want sloth in the house. We don't want no sluggards in the house. Amen? When people of deep commitment, people of deep industry, of focused diligence, that is what we want. And I want to encourage you, this is going to, to, to grow in your life like, like never before. I won't discuss it here because of time. But uh, this is, I want to get to something else. The various causes of laziness. Some people, I just listed five. Number one, an inaccurate view of work. An inaccurate view of work, which I will discuss if we get time. Secondly, an inaccurate view of the working of grace. Like I said, some people feel grace makes you lazy. But no, 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 no. If you are the recipient of grace, you will work far harder than you've ever done before, right? So the first point here, I said an inaccurate view of work. Some people view work as a result of the curse. Work is not a result of the curse. Before Adam fell, God gave him work. Then woman, in that order. <laughs> right? So the boy that comes home for Ray one day, I say, bro, Show me your work. <laughs> okay. Now, the third cause of uh, laziness is a spirit of entitlement, which is rampant in South Africa, where you feel, I don't need to do, put in the labor, put in, but I want, at the end of the day, I want my share, right? I will thrive off the hard work of others and come in at the end of the process and reap benefits. That spirit is selfish, it's self-centered, it's a spirit of pride. Um, and it must be killed. So tell your neighbor you're entitled to nothing. Right? You will get what you've worked for. You will get what you've worked for. God even says he rewards the labor of our hands. God sees your diligence. God will reward you. Okay. And then a fourth uh, a cause of laziness is the fear of failure. You don't want to because you're afraid if I do, I will fail. And that might dent my image or reputation. At the root of this is a spirit of pride. In Matthew 25, you want to make notes, there's that parable of the unprofitable servant there, right? The others used their talents, but he did not, right? And you know what he said? When, he, when his master asked him, why didn't you multiply yours like the others? The first thing he said, I feared. Right? So sometimes fear cripples us from doing the things we are called to do. Right? So this would be a cause for laziness. A fifth cause for laziness would be family disposition. Uh, your family heritage. Your family legacy. Now I come from a family of hard work. My father was an extremely hard worker. Boise, Harold, Edward, Barnwell. Worked from... Um, I didn't see him in the morning because he left at 5 a.m. He got up, he was gone. He would come back at between 6 and 7 in the evening. 
He was a builder. He was a master builder. Built houses full of sweat and dagger and dirt. And uh, I remember as a boy, my responsibility was to wash his, his feet um, and to get all that cement off particular things. But he was from the, the image I have of my father is this hardworking man. Right? And I think I got my diligence in part from that, seeing that whole thing. So everything I put my mind to, I do it with all of my, I do it with all of my heart. I hate drag. I told you on prior occasions, I taught for 17 years at high school, and the most irritating thing is when a class walks in after change of period, and people walk like this. <laughs> Some learners are even lazy to pick up their legs, <laughs> you know, and have a sense of va va vum a sense of zest, a sense of, of purpose, right? I hate people who drag their feet because it's symptomatic. I don't hate the people. I hate, the, I hate the, the practice of it because it's symptomatic of something more serious, okay? It's like laissez-faire, casual, you know, no, no focus, no sense of urgency. It's just, you know, blasé, yeah. What are the results of laziness? This is what I want to focus on. How do we remedy it? The causes can be uh, it's like a lesson in its own, okay? But I believe if we look at the results, maybe the results are powerful enough to deter you from the position. So what, what will result if you, are, if you are, are lazy? Let's just look at just quickly Proverbs 6, verse 9 to 11. Proverbs 6, verse 9 to 11. And then I'm going to draw out some, some principles from this and a few other verses of Scripture. How long will you lie down, O oh sluggard? You know, I like the way the writer of the Proverbs addresses the lazy man. It's like very intense. He says, how long will you lie down, O oh sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? One of the symbolic, metaphorical impressions of sleep in the Bible, apart from a host of things, is laziness. And you'll find lazy people often are given to sleep. Too much sleep. Okay? A little sleep, then he would say in verse 10. A little slumber. A little folding of the hands to rest. <laughs> and what is the result? Your poverty will come in like a vagabond. And your need like an armed man. Right? So you will tend to poverty. Now listen carefully. When you are poor, you have no resource. So debt becomes an option. Right? And you start incurring debt. Because debt is an easy option for the law, for, for the lazy person who refuses to work for his resource. Okay? So it comes in like a thief, like a robber. Poverty comes in like a vagabond, and you need like an armed man to rob you of your inheritance. Proverbs 10 and verse 4 says the following: Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, and the hand, but the hand of the diligent makes one rich. So if you are a lazy person, forget about being uh, a wealthy, forget about coming to a place of richness, forget about coming to a place of plenty, forget all those things because your laziness is a principle that's going to prevent you from coming to that position. Proverbs 20 verse 13, do not love sleep or you will become poor. <laughs> Maybe we should put this one. On the doors of our young people <laughs> that sometimes tend to oversleep in the holidays. <laughs> no, they deserve it because they work so hard in the course of the, of the term. Okay. Proverbs, uh, uh, sorry, Romans 11 verse 12 is a very important verse. Romans, ele Romans 12 verse 11. 12, 11. Not 11, 12. 12, 11 says, Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. The New King James. So this is lagging in indiligence. Lagging in diligence, the King James, I think says slothful or the NIV. I just forgot to put my reference here. It says, Do not slothful in. And this busyness here is not business as in a business. It should be read, not slothful in in haste, not slothful in speed. The word business here is the Greek word spaude, which literally means haste speed or diligence that's why other versions will translate it as not lagging in 
diligence. In other words, when it comes to diligence, earnestness, speed, haste, commitment, uh, you must have something called fervency of spirit. Because it says, don't be slothful in diligence, but rather have a fervency about you. Everyone say, be spirited. Right? You've got to be spirited. You've got to be intense. Okay, you've got you to you gotta do something. Those that do nothing get nothing. But those that do something will attain something. Okay, you're only going to get what you put in. And I wish, um, uh, uh, I've always been industrious as far as I can remember. But I wish these truths were told to us, uh, taught to us early on in life. Because the earlier you can get these principles, the more better for you. How would it be if our young people were the most hardworking, diligent, focused people on the planet? Okay? They would establish a solid foundation with the blessing of the Lord later on in their, in their adult lives. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9 to 12. I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures because these scriptures are going to speak to, your, to yourself. Hebrews 6 from... 9 to, to 12 says the following, But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. Everyone say better things concerning you. So he's contrasting this with some, some, some people that have gone on before, Israel in, in, in particular. And that things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way, verse 10, right? For God is not unjust so as to forget your, everyone say your work. So someone do something. Right? Now I know in context here the verse is speaking about the work in which you help or minister to the saints. But the principle still persists. Remember I taught you scripture as one interpretation, many applications. Right? So it is not unjust to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and still ministering to the saints. God will not forget how you've ministered to the saints. And still do. Both past and what is currently happening, God is not unjust to forget your labor of love. Then in verse 11 he says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence, uh, spouty, of earnestness, zeal, fervor, so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. And verse 12 is important, so that no one, you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience have inherited the, the promises. Okay? So the word for sluggish here, so that you will not be sluggish, but if you look at everyone, heroes of faith in particular, men and women in the old covenant that have worked hard for the purposes of God, literally given their lives for it, you must copy their patience and their faith. And don't lose heart and stop the process or the speed of momentum. If you're sluggish, you don't have momentum. You don't have speed. You don't have movement. Okay? The worst thing in life is for someone to impede your momentum. Right? And it's, it's, it takes a while to set up momentum. And to stop it is serious because it takes a while to restart it. So while you have the momentum, ride the wave, so to speak. You know? The word sluggish here literally in this context means dull. You become dull. And uh, I, I've discovered one thing. A lazy person is a dull person. Right? Dullness as in imperceptive. You're dull. Your sense of awareness and your sense of discernment even is, is squashed. Right? And even an opportunity can stare you in the face. Golden opportunity. But because you haven't developed the, re the requisite disposition of diligence, it passes you by unnoticed. But usually what I found, God brings powerful opportunities to the diligent. Why must he make you see what you cannot engage? Why must he bring powerful opportunities your way when you haven't developed the disposition to effectively or productively engage it? Okay. I would like to quote this verse in other versions of the Bible. It's so powerful. But time won't permit. I need to get to, to, to another place. Proverbs 13 verse 4 says the following. The soul of the sluggard craves, but he gets nothing. He wants, but he doesn't have. 
But the soul of the diligent is made fat, right? Uh, resourced, full, etc. Okay? The NLT in the same version says, lazy people want much, but they get little. All right? Have you ever spoken to a lazy person? Grandiose ideas. <laughs> they have of, of plenitude and plentitude and prosperity. And so you ask them, so what are you doing now to get there? <laughs> it's like nothing, okay? So it, it's very important. There's the strong desire, but no commensurate or associated work ethic or work effort, okay? Now, so your work... Uh, your lack of work, your laziness, your sluggard disposition, your slothfulness will tend to poverty. No resource will come to you. There will be an absence of your taking advantage of opportunities that uh, will stare you in the face, but you have not developed the internal disposition to engage it. Right? So you've got to work hard. I'm telling you, brethren, God will see your faithfulness in your current position and will bring the next thing open to you. But he will not bring anything new open to you if you prove lackadaisical, nonchalant in your present engagement. Whatever you find, I wish I put the verse in, come to me now. Ecclesiastes, Solomon said this, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all of your heart. Right? If you're picking up papers, let those papers know, no one has picked me up like this guy. Right? Do it with such focus with such uh, intensity, with such excellence, such faithfulness, because God will reward that level of diligence and, and faithfulness. Another point. What I want to go through is, while we talk about effects of laziness, some of these are general dispositions or characteristics associated with the slothful, sluggard person. Proverbs 21, 25. Now, I'm going to rush through this because of time and get to an end point. So please just buckle your seatbelts and go extremely fast, but note the principles. Let the scriptures speak to you. Proverbs 21, 25 to 26. Right? The desire of the lazy man kills him. For his hands refuse... Put the King James. I'd like it in King James. Right? It says the desire of the lazy man kills him. Or the New King James. For his hands refuse to labor. He covets greedily all day long, but right, the righteous gives and does not spare. This is a very, very powerful, uh, powerful verse. So the lazy person is covetous because it says he covets and he desires to, to have, contrasted with that position, is a righteous man by implication here is working hard with the intent of giving more the other is working with the idea of so i can give more the other doesn't want to work with the idea everybody must give me i want to be covetous i want to grab but the the righteous man is is working with the idea of i must up my giving somebody once says when your when your prosperity grows don't raise your standard of living Raise your standard of giving. Right? Tell your neighbor, seek to give more. You know, giving is one of the most powerful dispositions in Scripture that accesses all grace. And you, every one of us should make it our highest priority is to increase our levels of, of giving. A lazy person's giving will not increase because he has nothing to give. His whole disposition is receptive mode. Receptive mode. Okay? Now, notice in this verse, laziness is not contrasted with diligence. Laziness here is contrasted with the righteous person. If you read it carefully. So by implication, laziness is unrighteousness. Right? It's that serious. Right? So the workman, and even Paul says, the workman, he said to his son Timothy, the workman is worthy of his hire. Right? He's worthy of his, of his hire. Put the working, you will de you're deserving to be rewarded, in other words. So I want to encourage you, and if time, I don't think I'll get to it, a whole section here on how, if I work in the workplace, in my daily job, in the secular work, whatever my station in life, 
whether I'm a school teacher, the president, a policeman, whatever I do, that becomes my sphere of influence. That's where I represent God daily. And by how you work, everybody, based upon the levels of your faithfulness, your diligence, your punctuality, your support of your boss and his vision, your support of your colleagues, how you manage yourself in the workplace, people must conclude of you at the end of the day, righteous or unrighteous. Right? So how you work and your, your work ethic should testify to your righteousness. Your laziness is going to give off a loud signal. This person is unrighteous. Claim to be saved. Claim to be a son of God, but no work ethic. Right? So these things don't match, okay? You claim to serve God, but in the workspace, lazy. Right? We're going to banish laziness from the house. Amen? Tell your neighbor you're going to work like you've never worked before. <laughs> but tell them it will be in rest. It will be in grace. Amen? It will be in rest, and it will be in, in grace. Proverbs 19, verse 24. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish, but will not even bring it to his mouth. Now, how lazy can you be? You're hungry. The dish is in front of you. You put your hand in to take, but you're so lazy. You need somebody else to pick up your hand to even feed you. Okay? You know, the Proverbs really hit home, eh? They like drive the nail deep where it really matters, right? The, the principle here is that the, the lazy person doesn't take initiative. And even basic natural survivalistic instincts are ignored. But, I mean, you're hungry, any person. Food is there. I, I put my hand in and the natural, reflexive, instinctual thing to do is to feed yourself. He you can't even do that. So laziness has got serious, serious long-term results, okay? Again, opportunities will be in front of you, but even your nat what is base, what is basic, what is should be natural, what should be so automatic and reflexive is now so squelched, it's so doused within you, you can't respond to it, okay? I never want to get to that place where I have a serious need God brings the opportunity. But my disposition of lethargy over a period of time has so, has so killed natural initiative, instinctual, uh, survivalistic things even, that I cannot respond to something that could save me or bless me or enrich me. Okay? It's very, very, very serious. Okay? Proverbs 22 verse 13. This one is crazy. The sluggard says... There's a lion outside. I will be killed in the streets. The point here is, the lazy person uses imaginary and sometimes ludicrous excuses for not working. This guy says, you ask him, you interview him, how's it? Why aren't you working? Says, no, there's a lion outside in the street waiting for me. If I go to work, the lion is in the street waiting to, to pounce on me. Okay, so lions typically associated with the enemy, depending on the context, because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but the devil is also as a roaring lion. So, but one of the imageries of lion is things satanic or the demonic host or the demonic domain. So this guy says, no, I'm not going to go there because I'm afraid of spiritual warfare. I'm afraid of the attacks. No, you, you'll be immunized. But it's ludicrous because jungles normally house lions. Lions, the habitat of lions are jungles and bush, the bush. But he's referencing a street, an urban settlement. So his excuses, sometimes when you look at the excuses and you listen carefully to the excuses of a lazy person, they're incoherent. You know, things don't, things don't, don't match up. Okay? I tell you never, there's no lions in the streets waiting for you. May, may I say this to all of you prophetically? I know God will bring great opportunities for many of us here. Don't be afraid of the associated spiritual warfare that will come to you because you're going to venture into that realm. Because God, your Father, will be with you and He will protect you. Amen. 
Don't be afraid. Don't let fear cripple initiative and taking faith risks in God. Don't let it do that to you. Proverbs 20 and verse 4 says the following. The sluggard does not plow after the autumn, and so he begs in the harvest and has nothing. The sluggard does not plow after autumn, so he begs in the harvest and has nothing. So there's autumn and there's an, there's an approaching harvest. So there's no work done in one season. So when harvest time comes, he cannot harvest because of he hasn't prepared in one season to take advantage of the, of the next season. And so he's always left unadvantaged in a season where people are advantaged. And he stands out like a sore thumb. Everybody's harvesting, and he's not. Why? And it's not because of the season he's in. It's because of what he did not do in the previous season. So listen to me carefully. That's why the principles of sowing and reaping are very, very, very important. Don't despise a person when you see them in their harvest. And you say, wow, God is blessing them. Because you never know what efforts, what commitment what expressions of obedience and faithfulness that person put in in the time when they had to plow and they had to and they had to sow. Okay, so it's very important that you co you cooperate with the season that you are in. And I will talk in a moment to the preparedness, the issue of preparation that should attend any diligent person. You got to prepare for your next level. All right. If you think God is taking you somewhere, it doesn't just happen. You've got to plant or do the associated now activity for the then results. There's now and there's then. If you want to be blessed then, what are you doing now? When an elder in the AOG church first told me that God, he thinks God is calling me to be a Bible teacher. And, and he said to us to me, that's your end. But now what you must do is study the word like you've never studied before. And he said this to me, don't study to preach. Study to enrich yourself, right? And every day study something. If that's your end of harvest, then plant in or do now the associated um, activity for the then results, okay? Now, the next one, Proverbs 20, the same uh, verse 30 to 34. Proverbs 20, I think I have the wrong verse here. Sorry, Proverbs 24, my mistake. Proverbs 24, verse 30 to 34. I pass by. This is a commentary by the writer. He notices something. He says, I pass by the field of a sluggard. At least this guy owns something, right? He's got a field there. He passes by. And the vineyard of the man lacking sense. Just hold it there. You see, the sluggard always lacks sense. The sluggard always lacks discernment. There's a... There's something about being lazy that affects the mind. And uh, that there's, there's, it's not inconsequential that you are just lazy. It's going to have long-term effects upon mental vigilance. Vigilance, okay? And if a study one, he says, what was the field of the sluggard? Behold, it was completely overgrown. With, not with corn, not with grapes or olives, but with thistles. The land had potential for the harvest of productive crops, but thorns and thistles took over. Right? In other words, the element of the curse on the ground was thistles. Remember after the fall? So that dynamic seems to predominate this person's experience. Its surfaces were cover, covered with nestles, and its stone was broken. Its stone was broken down. Next verse. When I saw, I reflected on it, and I looked, and I got a word. I received instruction. And instruction is a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to, to rest. Then your poverty will come on you as a robber, and your want like an armed man. Principle here is simple. He has an inheritance because he has a field. Not so? There's some form of allotment attendant with him. 
But even that doesn't come to maximum productivity because of a spirit of neglect. For thorns to grow in a field means you've neglected to uproot the thorns and to engage in the planting of productive crop. Now, what I want to say to all of us, the issue of neglect is very, very important. Tell your neighbor, don't neglect what you already have. Don't neglect what you already have. You must watch over it. You must attend. You must take responsibility. There are others that are less fortunate than you. I, I shared a, a verse or thought on the church group in the week where I said, don't be, be content and be grateful for what you have because what you presently have now, someone is ardently and seriously praying for. They don't have what you have and they're praying and fasting for what you have. So ha be grateful for what you presently have, but also attend it. Don't let it devalue. Everyone say no devaluation. Right? Don't lose what you presently have because you will do with exactly more what you will do with what you have presently. What you do with what you have presently, you'll do exactly the same when you have more. So sometimes God will not give you the more because he sees the neglect of the... He who is faithful with, a few will also be faithful with, with much. So the principle still, still abides there. Okay? Next point. I'm going to fly because of time. The lazy man thinks he's wiser than even the most perfect expression of wisdom. Now listen to this. He thinks he's wiser than even the most perfect expression of wisdom. Have you ever chatted to a lazy person? Most of them can talk. <laughs> they can chew. <laughs> Most of them have the gift of the gab, and they can worm their way out of a situation with words. You know? They're like, there's a lion in the street. That's why I'm not here. There's a lion there. Right? And they find they can and easily... So this verse says the following. This is Proverbs 26 from 13 to 16. Watch. Proverbs 26, 13 to 16 says, The sluggard says, There's a lion in the road. This is now a separate verse. It says it twice in the Bible. <laughs> the lion, there's a lion in the road. A lion is in the open square. Right? And then the, the next verse says, As a door turns on its hinge, so does a sluggard on his bed. It's like, you know, a door, yeah, is attached. There's a hinge there. If you turn, it swings. The door is fixed to that hinge. It's going nowhere, right? So this, the lazy person has developed an uncanny association with his bed. He's devoted to it. He swings on it like a door swings on its, on its hinge. That's how, I like the writer of the book of Proverbs. It just like gets home to the person, okay? So the, the lazy person needs to be unhinged from something right now which should be giving, you know, bed is a form of covenant and a form of rest, metaphorically, symbolically. In scripture, a bed is a form of covenant, like marriage covenant, and also a form of sleep, which is an indication of rest. But the sluggard is swinging on this, on this, this, this issue, this factor. So he has, a, he has, a, he has a, a misinformed perception of rest. Thinks he's in rest, but he really isn't. Okay, next verse quickly. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish, I've said this, and he's wary of bringing it to his mouth again. Then the next verse says, The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can give him a discreet answer. You get, you get seven wise men with perfect wisdom. Seven is perfection. The sluggard has an answer for all of them. It's like, it's like he can answer corporate wisdom and still justify his, his present position of, of laziness. Now, second, the next point is, have any of you, how many people, pick your hands up, have you encountered a lazy person or maybe lived with one? If they're here, don't pick up your hand. <laughs> or maybe in your workspace, you know, uh, I was a teacher for many years. I experienced some sluggard teachers. Uh, maybe in your workspace, you've got a few of these or friends. What is the effect on you? The effect is not just on them. The effect is also on you or in our industries. This verse says the following. This is Proverbs 10.26. 10.26 says, 
like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes. So is the lazy one to those who send him. So, I mean, it, who loves vinegar straight up? <laughs> no one, right? It needs to be used in association with other things, right? But if there's an irritation or an annoyance or distasteful thing about vinegar. And uh, those of you who you know, smoke to the eyes, it's nasty, okay? So it impairs perception. Smoke to the eyes impairs perception. Taste, teeth, taste is also a matter of discernment. So sometimes if you accommodate a lazy person in your world, it'll affect you somehow. So you've got to be very careful about being too closely associated in an intimate sense with a lazy person. Okay? In the, the idea here, because there's ascending, everyone say ascending. There's ascending by those in authority. Send a lazy person out to do a specific job. And the job obviously here yeah, is, is not done. Right? So the issue of representation comes into being here. Any sent one must be thoroughly representative of the one who sent him, right? And fulfill the task. So a lazy person cannot in any way officially represent God their father, right? Who sent you into the world to execute your job in diligence, in faithfulness, in excellence. So as to when you do that, people see your good works. The Bible says, and they glorify God your, your father, but if you are tardy, if you are indolent, if you are lazy, lethargic, sluggish, slow, dragging, delay, a not on time kind of person, people see that. And they ask, oh, you claim to be the son of God. Now listen to me carefully. Never mind just honoring your earthly boss. And that there's a place for that which I'll talk about in a moment. You must work diligently at what you do so as to honor your employers. Right? But you are sent by a greater dimension. In your workplace, so in Colossians and in Ephesians, I'll get to the verses in a moment, it says anybody now who is a son of God who works must not work as men pleases to those who are in authority over him, but must work as unto pleasing God, your father. So tell you never, God is your ultimate boss. So I will, uh, I will never be late for school. When I was a teacher, I was at school at, I think at 7 o'clock. Five past seven, most days, um, because the nature of the work, etc. I would see sometimes some teachers waltzing like this, dragging their feet in some one or two of the schools I taught at. Totally no zest, no job satisfaction. The job had become a drudgery. Sad to say, some of those claimed to be sons of God. That did not bring honor and glory to, to God. It got so bad in one school, a person who claimed to be a son of God did not heed the warnings of my principal. And it was such an embarrassment when he was forced to call in the pastor of the person to his office because he couldn't appeal to any sense. So he thought maybe the pastor would at least speak to him. Because I was deputy um, at the school, I was called into the meeting as well and I had to listen to all of this. It's not a good testimony. The scripture says we must have a good repute, especially in the, in the world. Amen. So everyone say, up your diligence. Tell your neighbor, don't be vinegar to me. <laughs> don't be smoke to me. Okay. Now, in fact, if you do a, a word, if you do a Greek word search on, on sluggish or slothful, Thoughtful in the New Testament. Okneros, the root okneo, literally means that which is irksome. To irk is to irritate or to annoy. If you irksome, you are an irritant or you are an annoyance. And that is the effect of the slothful person to those, to those um, around him. Okay. Now, look what... Um, Paul said, let me read these scriptures to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 9 to 12. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 to 12. 
Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it towards the brethren who are still in Macedonia. But we urged you, brethren, to excel still the more. So Paul had this expectation on the, the guys at Thessalonica. You love the guys, but take it to the next level. Excel all the more. And make it your ambition to lead a quiet and to attend to your own business or busyness and work with your hands just as we had commanded you. And verse 12 says, so that you will behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. Paul had an expectation for the people in Thessalonica that they would not come to a place where they have a need. This is biblical. Why? Because their commitment to work with their own hands is so strong and blessed by God and their behavior is so credible and righteous towards outsiders, people in the world. When God sees the entire package, God says, I bless you. Listen to me. Don't just think that God's going to bless me in my workspace. Yes, I need this favor. I seek that God, but you're not going to represent him accurately in the same domain. You have to have both dynamics working together like hand in glove. And Paul says, you guys at Thessalonica, so glad you love the brethren. Please excel all the more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet and peaceable life. Work hard with your, with your own hands so that you'll have or not be in any need. This is a biblical place that every single one of us can, can come to. Okay? Proverbs, 20, Proverbs 12, 27 is another thought-provoking position on the lazy person. The lazy man does not roast his prey. Catches it, but doesn't roast it. But the precious possession of a man is his diligence. Okay? The precious possession of a man is his diligence. So you caught the prey, but you don't roast the prey. In other words, you don't convert resource that you currently have into make it more productive or to for greater productive usefulness, right? You, the idea is you cannot take raw resource and make it useful uh, or nourish a source of nourishment for your, for your well-being. Now, everyone say creativity. What we're going to pray, one thing we're going to pray for in a moment is that God will bring to us a creativity. We will open our eyes to see what is in our house. Remember the word I taught a few weeks ago, the oil is in the house? Right? The oil is in the house. What do you have? But sometimes the position of laziness has so scarred the mind and our mentality that we, we, we don't see that we can take what we have, convert it into greater, more productive usefulness so that our lives will be all the more well-nourished and preserved here afterwards, okay? So this is a very, very important uh, disposition. I wrote here my notes here. They might have access to raw material. They got the prey, but lack the insight and hard work to use it wisely to generate products which, by which they could, or services by which they could be benefited, okay? So this is, this is, this is critically, critically important, okay? Now, Proverbs 15, 19 strikes home. The way of a lazy, of the lazy, is a hedge of thorns. But the path of the upright, again here, yeah, I want to encourage you, laziness is not contrasted with hard work. Laziness is contrasted with righteousness, the upright. The implication is the lazy person has a position of unrighteous behavior. The way of the lazy is a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a highway. Now, Liam spoke at the table of the Lord about the, the Haggai principle, where we must, if we build God's house, God will build your house. Take care of God's house, God will build your panel house. Take care of God's people, in the process, you also will be blessed. But how can you bless others when you yourself aren't blessed? A lazy person is not blessed. Neither can be a blessing. The opposite is that 
he is likened unto a hedge of thorns. So, as do anyone loves loves thorns? Yeah, you come, you want to hug them, you want to embrace, fellowship with the thorn. Anybody? Nobody here, right? So, what will inevitably happen is the lazy person will tend to isolation over a period of time. His propensity for fellowship will be reduced, right? Drastically reduced. The, the hardworking righteous man, on the other hand, his hard work is likened unto a highway. You see, the hedge of thorns blocks up the way, but the, the hardworking, diligent man's life creates a highway for others to walk on. A path, you craft a path by your diligence and example for others to copy and to emulate you in the same. You never know the power of your example of hard work. You never know what you are crafting in the realm of the spirit when you are focused, when you are diligent. You're making a way for others to follow in the same path, particularly your offspring. Never ever let it be said of you as a parent, my mother, my father was lazy. Too much time in front of the TV. Too much time like a door hinged, he's hinged to his bed. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands and poverty has come to this house. Okay? So we must be diligent. Look what Paul said in Ephesians 4.28 regarding this. He said the following. He who steals must steal no longer. You know the Old Testament law, one of the commandments is, of the ten is, thou shalt not steal. That's the law. In the New Testament grace, the command still persists, do not steal. But in grace, something else is also added. Right? But you can keep the law in the New Testament because of grace. Right? The grace dynamic allows you to keep the law of the Lord. This verse says, He who steals must steal no longer, but must rather labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who is in need. Notice again, the, the, the ambition or the objective, the goal of the diligent is to work hard, yes, so that he can provide for his own needs, but the back of the mind of the hard worker is, I want to be in a position of blessing to others. I will work hard so I can have enough for my, myself, my family, and also to share with, to share with others. This is a very powerful position. Okay. Now, just quickly, I'm going to rush through this. In Proverbs 6, verse 5, the writer of the book of Proverbs gives an answer to the sluggard. A solution to the lazy man is Proverbs 6, verse 5. And remember, Andy quoted this verse early on in the series. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hunter's hand, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant. Next verse. Go to the ant, O oh, sluggard. Observe her ways, which having no chief officer or ruler, no supervisor, no boss over her, no one to watch her and to make sure she's punctual, or working hard in a particular way. No supervisory principle. But the next verse is, but prepares her food in the summer, gathers her provision in, in, the, in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And your poverty will come upon you like a vagabond and your need like an, an armed man. Now listen to me. Not everything about God is located in the word of God. Not everything about God can be learned from his word. Because his word tells you that when he made everything, all of creation declares the glory of God. Proverbs 19, right? Psalm 19, Proverbs 19, Psalm 19. All of creation declares the glory of God, and the earth shows forth its handiwork. Day unto day it utters speech and declares His glory. So there's stuff about creation that can teach me about God, His purposes, His ways, His works. Because His Word tells me 
Go to creation, study it, because encoded in creation is my glory. So the sluggard is instructed to do an analysis of the ants. If you meet any sluggard person, give them an assignment. Go study the end, brother. <laughs> Everyone say go. You must go. You must do something. And it says observe ways. I won't have time to decode this word observe. It's a powerful verse, word in the Hebrew. Just quickly. It, it means also to consider in some versions. Consider the end thou sluggard. Observe ways. It means to watch, to see, so as to learn. To perceive, to look out after, to watch, to find to select, to look into, to inquire, to take heed of, to discern, to reflect upon, to make mental observation of. Go to the end. And not a cursory perusal, not a casual glance. Go to her and study her diligently. Okay? Now, uh, some time ago, I think it was Leah who did that, that thing on the end with us. Years ago. But I... Uh, Maybe we should revisit that. Maybe one of you can do a presentation here on the end. If Jesus was alive today, you know what his parables would be? Because he used the events of his day to, ed to teach spiritual principles. Okay? So, construct a modern parable. Go to the end. Look at a natural case study to draw out spiritual principles. Okay? So, just quickly... When the Bible says observer ways, the word for ways there is derek in the Hebrew. And it, it relates to patterns of life. Observe her methodologies, her ways of, of operations. Um, I listed a few things and then we're going to pray because of time. The thing about an ant, it prepares for winter. Not so? Besides its diligence, besides its obvious hard work, have you ever seen an ant on its back, sipping, smoking? You come in your garden, how's it? I'm just cooling off, chilling. No, no, you've never seen an ant like that. Ants are always busy bodies, on the move, usually in search for, for food. Okay? Diligent, hard workers have the sense of momentum. So, in Proverbs 6, 8, it says, He prepares her food in summer. And gathers a provision in the, in the harvest. Proverbs 30 verse 24 says the following. Four things are small on the earth. But they are exceedingly wise. The ants are not a strong people. But they prepare their food in, in summer. They know how to prepare in one season. To be advantaged in the, in the next season. Okay. They know exactly how to do this. So listen carefully. I just get the impression of, uh, I put a note to the effect on the church group the other day that six months of 2020 have come and gone. For your information, <laughs> in case you're not aware of this, we only have six months to 2020. And there's so much talk already on Facebook about 2020. What's it going to be like? Prophetic implications. Who is going to be the year of favor? And even that sounds nice, 20. 20. I can just see all the New Year's, end of this year, all the New Year's messages. Oh, it's going to be happening, brother. Great things. But it will be for you next, I tell you now, the next six months will determine what 2020 will be for you. Not a final message on the last day of the year. It's what you do now that's going to mean everything for next year. Amen. And I've done a serious, starting to do a serious appraisal on how I spend my time and doing what I need to start doing things that I can take advantage of in next year. Tell you never go to the end. Learn from our ways. Please don't let the next six months be a lazy six months. Put in the work. Don't casually spend too much TV time. TV is a time waster. Use it. Yes, I, I watch movies, etc. But I'm not, I'm not obsessed by sitting in front of it and, and flitting away time unnecessarily. Okay? Put in the, the time. Okay? The principle of sowing and reaping. Just one quick reminder. I taught this 
on my website, there's a CD at the back there called Sowing and Reaping, where we did that CD. I think we did about 10 or 11 sessions. I discussed reasons why re the reasons why people sow and don't reap. And there are many. But one reason that I want to remind you of is Proverbs 10 verse 5. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps. Everyone say sleeps. So sleeps is an indication of laziness. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who acts shamefully. A bumpy neighbor say, don't sleep in harvest. Okay, you've sown, you've sown. You've done the right thing in the prior season. You've sown, but now you're in a season of harvest. And you are sleeping when you should be harvesting. Right? So sleep here indicates there are five things which I explain in detail in the, in that, on that CD, but I'll just mention them. Sleep indicates giving over to the works of the flesh. Because in, in the Bible uses carnality. Paul used carnality as an expression of, of sleep. You've done the right thing in one season. You come to harvest, but you're given over to works of the flesh. You will not harvest. Indifference. If you're sleeping, you are indifferent. Not so. You're clueless as to what's going on around you. You're unconscious in a sleep mode. So lack of vigilance. And then laziness. Thirdly, it represents laziness, unawareness. Fourthly, and prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. Sleep also represents prayerlessness. Now listen carefully. There's a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 6, I think, which says, Let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not faint. Do not lose heart. Tell someone, do not be discouraged now. Don't be discouraged. I'm telling you, brethren, whatever you're experiencing in life, now is not, the, you can't harvest from being discouraged discouragement is going to uh, uh, reduce your capacity to take full advantage of your season of of harvest so the ant prepares in one season to harvest in the next it's an extremely intense and vigilant uh, animal okay then the principle of leadership i just said to you we read the scripture in proverbs 6 6 to 8 that she has no chief the ant has no chief not so no leader but does the right thing. They are not leaderless. There's a queen ant in the colony. One or two of them in most colonies have one major one, and some big colonies have two ant colonies. Former series they're called, an ant colony. So there is a kind of person that they honor amongst them. It's the queen ant. Principle of honor, and they work only to feed the colony food. The corporate welfare, the corporate state of everybody is very important to the ant. So the ant works privately to enrich the corporate welfare of the colony. So if you're working for selfish motivation, don't go to the ant. The ant will tell you, you know why I'm so focused here? I have a queen I need to honor. I have other brothers and sisters, worker ants, some, some uh, military ants, there are class, various classifications. Some builder ants that all need to forage. You see this crumb in my, in my mandible here? I am taking not for my own needs. You see them how they go with food in the mouth. I'm servicing the colony. Corporate welfare is why I work. And I'm telling you, God will richly bless you when you have this mentality. So therefore, the lazy person who doesn't work doesn't work. He doesn't only not care for himself, but he has no regard for the house, for the corporate house. But when the welfare of the corporate state of the church is your brothers and sisters, is your, is your preeminent welfare, God will most certainly bless you in what he has called you to do. You might interview the ant and say, who's driving you? Who's watching you? Who's observing your diligence, making sure you're on time? You know, when, when ants, most of them, some have eyes, some, have, some don't. But most times, when they forage, they go out, their body secretes a chemical called pheromones. And they leave it along their path as they go. And when they find a source of food, they know, I'll get the crumb, or the little sweet or whatever I got, and I know the way back. 
because I can trace by sensory perception with the antenna, I trace it my way back to the colony. So when I come into my breakthrough, I don't forget my way back. When I come into my reach, I don't forget where I come from. And I don't forget I have a queen there. The only purpose of the queen is to reproduce. Some, some uh, wingless ants, male ants, only purpose is to mate with the queen so to as to ensure the perpetuity of the, the colony. The queen, by the way, can, can live up to 30 years. Right? Some worker ants up to six months. But you can say, but yeah, you are a short life, but you're having to secure that one. <laughs> says, yeah, for this I was born. <laughs> for this I was... <laughs> you know? Everyone say purpose. Right? So there's a strong principle of honor in an ant, yet there's no leader supervising her. It's not leaderless. I, think, I view it like this. The ant has so imbibed the principle of leadership, it doesn't need a leader to watch it. Right? So, so reflexively part of, of everything that it, that it constitutes. Because of time, I'm just quickly go to this. Other ants, you see, the ant, let's say, discovers you left a piece of bread in your garden. He encounters this breakthrough. Wow! Breakthrough! One crumb is all I can manage. Go back, follow my pheromones, and I go back to the colony. I don't even talk to anybody. I just go back. But every time I follow my trail, I drop more pheromones. And the scent becomes stronger and stronger. Other ants pick up. There's a strong scent here. And then they suddenly join the bandwagon. And that's why you will see like ants like in a straight line. Have you seen that? Not everybody all over the place doing his own thing. There's like order. There's rank. There's regimen. There's a focusness about them. Right? And they all, in other words, one breakthrough of one individual becomes the breakthrough of the entire colony. Nobody is self-serving. No one is selfish. In fact, some the research I did, sometimes when they scatter and they forage in several different directions, and let's say one ant goes a long distance away from the colony, dropping his pheromones and discovers a source of food and comes back. And his brother next to goes the opposite direction but a much shorter distance and it discovers a source of food. So he, the shorter, the guy with the shorter distance will over, obviously do more comebacks. And the sin gets stronger every time they do. This guy who went on the other end of the world comes back and says, oh, my sin is so less stronger than that guy's. I will leave this source of food and join where it's, where it's stronger. So my brother's breakthrough becomes my breakthrough. The, my brother's breakout breakthrough becomes the path that I also will pursue. So when he joins the bandwagon of his brother's path, his brother doesn't say to him, find your own way. <laughs> find your own source of food. No. He says, yes, let's all gravitate and pull our resources and take advantage of this one source so as to enrich our corporate welfare Instead of you doing your own thing, going your own long way, there's a much quicker, shorter way of, of doing it. Now, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 12 says the following. In this respect, now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, a door was opened for me in the Lord. Paul's words. Who likes open doors? Huh? Paul says a door was opened for me. But then it says in the next verse, I had no rest in my spirit for not finding Titus, my brother. Now, the only thing that caused Paul unrest, he was a man of rest, but he says the only thing that will cause me unrest is that a huge door has been opened, opportunity obviously for the gospel, but I don't want to walk through the door alone. I need to walk through that open door with my brother. Everyone say, take your brother with you. Huh? And let me just say this prophetically. I believe God's going to open huge opportunities for some of us in this house. But please remember this. It's not for you privately, personally. Take your brother through your open door with you. Right? So long as you have the same motivation, we must enrich the colony. Yeah? You know, ants are known for their industry. Not so busyness. But they're not busy 
Because you can't be a busy body without being productive. Right? You must make sure your busyness, you must measure what you've done at the end of the day. It must, it must count, right? And it, it must build into all that God is leading you into. Time is gone. I'm nowhere near where I wanted to go. Let me round off. I'll, I'll have to continue this at another stage. An ant, they say, even the scripture says, is not a strong people. We just, without thinking, with your thumb can kill the thing. Right? It's, it's the way it's body makeup. But Google it. I, I challenge all of you. Do your own private study on the ant. And study is its skeletal biological system. It's fantastically engineered, crafted. When I see, and look at the detail, you see the genius of God. All creation reflects the glory of God. And the sluggard is commanded to go to this ant to study her, to study her ways. And I'm saying if you're corporately minded, God will bless your efforts. But an ant, they say, some, some, some sources say an ant can carry up to 50 times its body weight. Some say 30 times. Well, let's just take 50. It's a better figure. <laughs> can you carry 50 times your body weight? Some of you can't even carry your body weight. <laughs> Never mind, 50 times. <laughs> There's Lauren pregnant here carrying weight. Right? But imagine, I mean, we t I used to do bodybuilding. You know the clean and place? That's a difficult maneuver, right? But imagine picking up 50 times your weight. It's like amazing feat. But the ant can put some humans to shame in this regard. But it's, I think, just the way the, the ant is, is wired. You know what? I learned a new word in studying this. Uh, some writers say the ant is you social. EU, the word EU, and then the word social. It's you social. You, the, the prefix EU means good. And obviously social has got to do with people. So it's a good for the people. So you sociality. Everyone say you sociality. A new word for you. Okay. Let me conclude this by saying this. Characterize the concept you sociality. Is, uh, many insects have it, but the ant is known for it. Characterized by the following features. Watch. Cooperative brood care. And by what, what do they mean by cooperative brood care? It's not just caring. They say cooperative brood care is not just caring for your own offspring. But you developed a maternal instinct and care for the offspring of everybody else. So everybody's children becomes yours. Right? Ants have that. Right? So... Secondly, just because of time, there's always overlapping generations in one colony at any one point in time. So you have son, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, the possibility of a generational disposition in the colony. Isn't God a generational God? Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. Okay? And then lastly, division of labor into reproductive and non-reproductive groups. Some ants are purely designed to reproduce with the, with the female queen ant so as to perpetuate the species. There are other worker ants who work to find new pathways, drilling, um, what do you call these things? Furrows um, to expand the colony or to find new sources of food underground. Some, some worker ants also function on top of the ground just purely looking for food. And there are some defensively minded ants. And this, this blew me away. They're like military ants. They're like, they're like the army division of the group where their sole purpose is to defend the colony. Even at the most uh, uh, difficult of predators, 10 times their size, ants got no problem what they call performing suicidal missions. They won't mind losing their life so as long as they can defend the, the queen specifically. There was one particular uh, uh, species where if, for example, you have a mound and there's a, a whole colony, a formosary underneath, a 
And if that is threatened by a hugely significant predator externally, they come on the outside, form a mound, as to block every single hole in the mound so forcefully, knowing they will not be able to re-enter it. As long as everybody else is safe, and they know they're going to die in the process. Everyone say martyrdom. They live in the spirit of martyrdom. What Paul says, I do not count my life dear unto myself. He said this in, Psalm, in Acts 20. He said, if by all means I might fulfill the ministry that the Lord God has, has given to me. But you know, ants have an amazing quality to work cooperatively. Have you ever seen two ants carrying something together? If you look at this on, on, on Google, you'll find pictures of ants carrying huge leaves, two of them together. Right? We, <laughs> two is better than one, not so. Right? So you work in harmony, you work in cooperation to ensure that your brother's ants or your, your, brother, your brother's uh, feet are sufficiently facilitated by your help to your brother. Do you know, ironically, the only continent that doesn't have ants is Antarctica. <laughs> I, thought, I, thought, I just laughed at this. Read that. Oh, if anybody should have ants, it must be Antarctica. <laughs> you know they're known for their momentum and speed based upon their size. But you know there's one species of ant that can close its jaw from open to close mode at a rate of 225 kilometers per hour. Scientists have measured this. Imagine that sting on your backside. <laughs> right? Ants are extremely powerful. So tell you never go to the ant thou sluggard. Now I'm gonna have to complete this at another stage, two weeks from now, I'll complete this. Okay. But for now, what I want to encourage you to do is to stand with me. Just stand with me. God's going to bless the work of our hands. I'm telling you, brethren. He's going to bless the work of our hands to such a degree. We're going to be known for industry. But we're going to build something in the realm of the Spirit. I think Liam's reading at the table of the Lord was apt in reference. He didn't know what I'm preaching about. So I think the message just dovetails so, so powerfully. But any trace of sluggishness, lethargy, drag and i want to warn you against discouragement don't become discouraged not now you cannot afford to be asleep in your harvest okay the next six months are going to count and i think going into 2020 will be significant for our corporate house but god wants to bless us in ways that will literally astound us amen god never gives significant objectives to lazy people but it requires your work Work is not a result of the fall. God always established work before Adam fell. He expected him to steward and to tend the garden. Okay. But God will bless the efforts of your hands. And he will bless, the scripture says, the work of your hands. I will share those details and the, uh, some of the principles with you next time. But what I want to encourage you to do is the Lord... Uh, literally said to me that we must pray for protection over the arenas of our work and our the areas in which he has called us to to function you're going to thrive i say this to you prophetically you will thrive in the area in which god has placed you and you'll be well protected there when your motivations are right before him amen you will be well protected there nothing ill will befall you there and God will promote you, bring opportunities for increase and development your way. I believe this to be true, and this is going to happen for many, many of us. Mark my words, some of you are going to have testimonies this coming week of breakthroughs, of awesome breakthroughs in God. So lift your hands to Him. May it never be said of us, as Jesus said to that, lazy steward who buried his talents in Matthew 25 you wicked and lazy slothful servant 
may it never be said of us that we are of that group. But we will be amongst the most hardworking, the most diligent. Like Paul, we would say, we labor, yet not us, but the grace of God that is with us. Father, today we thank you for your presence. I want to thank you for the, your word. Your word is so encouraging. I ask now in Jesus' name, O oh God, that you would enrich your house. I bless this house in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I bless by the utterance of my words every single hand, every single family. For those that are unemployed, I pray that employment will come their way in the name of the Lord. For those that are employed, O oh God, I ask for favor. I ask for promotion. I ask for your kindness to be expressed upon us in ways that will amaze us. I thank you that none of us will be robbed of our inheritance in the workplace. But there in that arena, we will demonstrate whose we are. That we are the sons of God in the midst of a crooked and a wicked world. I bless this house economically. I bless this house secularly with the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and adds no sorrow with it. The Lord bless you. The Lord prosper you. The Lord guard you. The Lord guide you. The Lord bless the works of your hands. The, word, the Lord honor you the works of your hands. The Lord make you successful. The Lord make everything your hand touches to prosper. The Lord make everything your hand touches to be successful. How blessed is the man who does not sit in the seat of the scornful, stand in the way of sinners, walks in the way of the ungodly. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he does meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and whatever he does prospers. I speak that blessing of someone over your house, Father. And I ask, O oh God, that this will all be to your glory. We will not forget the colony of the Lord's house. We will not forget the principle of leadership and how to honor it. For you will bless us in everything our hands find to do. And Father, we, we bow to the authority of your word. Everything we have heard today, we submit. We bow our hearts and we say, Amen. Come on, everyone say, Amen to the word. Say, Amen. amen. So be it, Lord. And Father, I pray the power of what we've heard will play itself out in everybody's life in a very, very significant way. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. Amen.